Okay, so uh, today we are going to talk about the variational autoencoders and uh, their application for the analysis of the uh, imaging and spectral data. So predominantly for the analysis of the imaging data. So uh, the reason why autoencoders are exceptionally useful is uh, threefold. So first of all, they uh, can be used to do a lot of classical operations such as uh, clean the data, do the da partial data restoration, and so on and so forth. Secondly, autoencoder is an exceptionally powerful method in order to discover the hidden low dimensional physics in the imaging or spectral data. And uh, finally, uh, the autoencoders can be extended to be the uh, foundational element of the deep kernel learning. So it's except a very powerful algorithm. And uh, uh, more importantly, quite a few of uh, ways how we can extract meaning from data would be based on the classical autoencoder concept. So let's start with the basic definition. So what is the autoencoder? How does it work? What are the basic notions associated with its use? So imagine that uh, we have a neural network where the input we have uh, some data. So it can be images, it can be spectra, it can be anything. Once we have this data in place, we send it through the set of the convolutional funnels. So it can be a few convolutional layers, a few dense layers, but ultimately it becomes uh, uh, channel down to a latent uh, layer. And the key thing about this latent uh, layer is that it has a relatively small dimension. So our initial data set can be high dimensional. Latent layer actually is supposed to be a fairly low dimension. Once we get this latent uh, value, what we do is we take it and then we decode it back to the original uh, data or the original data format. So uh, if you remember the lectures by Tommy and Diana, we have something resembling the latent layers in the units. But in this case, there we also have skip connections and their purpose is to uh, do the supervised learning. So in this case, the purpose of the network is actually to channel the data through this latent layer. The way autoencoder is trained is by trying to minimize the difference between the training data and the restore data. So if you want to oversimplify it, you can actually say that the autoencoder is the neural network that tries to reconstruct the data from itself, which sounds to be a sort of a little bit uh, unusual and it's not clear why it is useful. It turns out that it is exceptionally useful and uh, let's go through the few basic definitions and then uh, go through a few uh, examples of how the autoencoders can be used. So let's start from the kind of look under the hood and look what this part of the autoencoder does. So this part is called the uh, encoder. It takes our data and uh, encodes it into the latent value vector. And uh, it is very common to illustrate autoencoders using the, or pretty much any network using the MNIST data set. So on the input, we are going to have the images of the handwritten digits. So these uh, images are 28 by 28. So this is uh, whatever, 764 dimensional data set. Imagine that our autoencoder uh, encodes this data in the two dimensional space. So two dimension, uh, of course, uh, we can have any dimension of latent space from one to uh, sort of hundred. Uh, two is very convenient because then it becomes easier to visualize what goes on. Also, interestingly, uh, for many imaging applications, when our data is relatively simple, very often two is actually enough. Uh, obviously, when you deal with the more complex system and larger number of factor variability, you will take more and I will illustrate you how we select that. So anyway, we start with the images, we encode it in the latent space, and then uh, the way that you can represent the data in the latent space is so-called uh, latent uh, distribution. So here, the first axis is the first latent uh, vector. 
The second axis is the second latent vector. And basically we start with the image and we represent it as the uh, latent vector, which has only two components. So we can plot it into D. And then uh, what we can do is we can explore how the different digits uh, distributed themselves in the latent space. So what we do is we just use the, uh, the digit label as a marker. And you can see that all the ones are sitting in this part of the Latin space. All the sevens are sitting in this part of the Latin space. And all zeros are sitting in this part of the Latin space. So this is one of the very important characteristics of our encoders. And that's one of the reasons why we use it in imaging uh, quite extensively because it allows us to represent the high dimensional data as a low dimensional representation and uh, sort of analyze the properties of this distribution. So let's make the next step. What else can we do? So the next thing we can do is we can decode from the latent space. So remember that when we have a latent vector, the way the whole thing is trained is by learning how to take this latent representation and uh, uh, deconvolute it into the data with the same dimensionality as the original data set, meaning in the image. So original image goes in, reconstructed image goes out. So if we take a point that corresponds to the original data set and we decode it, we will get something close to the original data set. Not exactly, but uh, close. But the really amazing thing about the out encoders is that nobody tells us that we should be decoding from the points in the Latin space where there is an example. In fact, we can take a point which does not correspond to any of the original training examples. So uh, this is the reason why autoencoder is the generative model. It can generate the new data that looks almost exactly like the original one or what is called to be a, the in-distribution data set. So uh, by now, Obviously, the most famous example of the generative model are Charge GPT and the similar technologies, but uh, our encoders been uh, before the Charge GPT. So the second key concept that we need to know in the concept of the out encoders is the concept of the latent representation. So in order to do that, imagine that we take points uh, on the in the latent space on the uh, square grid. And then we decode the images corresponding to these points. So this is what we are going to get. Uh, and uh, for convenience, we can kind of put these images and arrange them in the uh, matrix like this one. So when you look at this uh, latent representation, uh, you can see that uh, it clearly has some internal structure. So again, ones are sitting here, sevens are he sitting here, nines are sitting here, zero are sitting here. It makes perfect sense because, oops, sorry, perfect sense because when we have the uh, Latin distribution, ones are here, are sevens are here. So it's not surprising that when we do, uh, when we uh, calculate the Latin representations, ones are here and sevens are here. But you can notice one very important thing, which is exceptionally important uh, for all the applications of the uh, out encoders. So when we have our original data set, we have uh, regions of the Latin space, which have a lot of points. So all ones are roughly the same, uh, or all sevens are roughly the same. And then we have a gaps between them. So generally it kind of makes sense because people try to uh, write uh, digits so that one can be different, different from seven. Once we go to the Latin space and Latin representation, we can actually interpolate between ones and sevens. So if you follow the motion of the uh, pointer, you can see that we started with ones here. And uh, if we move along this line, that ones start to become more and more like seven. So this is a unique property of the out encoders that it allows to interpolate between the data. Sometimes this interpolation makes sense. So one and sevens are almost the same. You can kind of argue that four and nine would be uh, would be very similar. Sometimes this interpolation does not work. For example, if I move from one towards the zeros, I clearly have some uh, symbols here which are uh, kind of look like they're almost in Klingon. 
And uh, that makes perfect sense because you cannot imagine uh, going from zero to one, at least in a sort of elegant way. So uh, this is the second thing that kind of matters quite, uh, is exceptionally useful. Now, how important are our encoders? So uh, you probably have heard the name of uh, Jeff Hinton. So one of the fathers of the machine learning and probably a, one of the most cited uh, scientists in the world at this point. So this is a screenshot from his uh, Google Scholar, uh, from his Google Scholar. So you can see that uh, his ImageNet paper uh, has uh, 130,000 citations. So that's kind of very impressive. But one of his top cited papers, sort of almost uh, 20,000 citations, is actually reducing the dimensionality of data with the neural networks. So this is the paper about the autoencoders. So autoencoders are really made an important effect. So what can we use the autoencoders for? So uh, traditionally, the way the autoencoders used are for the problems such as uh, image restoration or denoising. So the way you do that is you take your data set, you artificially corrupt it with the noise, and then you train the autoencoder by the pairs of the high noise and low noise image. So you give the autoencoder as an input the high noise image, but the output now should be the low noise image. And then this way the autoencoder learns how to distill the essential traits in the images and then reconstruct them. So as an example, uh, this is the original image. Uh, this is the image that is corrupted with the noise. So as you can see, you can barely see the original digits. And uh, this is what happens if I try to apply the denoising out encoder to that. So uh, this actually works remarkably well. Uh, is there a danger associated with this procedure? Yes, because when the autoencoder is trained on a certain data set, it learns the features inside this data set. And uh, it can reconstruct the digits or any other objects only in distribution compared to this data set. So, uh, for example, if you decide to use the autoencoders to analyze things like ill spectrum or images or any other data set, and let's say your ill spectrum had certain feature that corresponds to the some element, then if you apply a thus trained autoencoder to the data set that does not contain this feature, autoencoder will still try to find it. So basically, uh, the bottom line is that it's very powerful technique, but uh, you can use it to uh, kind of clean up the data but if you want to prove something, you always need to go to the original data set and apply the uh, statistical, appropriate statistical method to figure out whether it is true or not. So as all of you heard, ChatGPT can hallucinate. So autoencoders can also hallucinate and they hallucinate the features that were in the data set that they were trained on. So another way we can use autoencoders is the image restoration. So in this case, the principle is almost the same. We uh, train the autoencoders on the pairs of the grayscale and color images. And after the autoencoder is trained, we will provide the new grayscale images, but from the same distribution. And uh, the autoencoder can reconstruct the color. So what is the catch? The catch is going to be exactly the same. That imagine that we train our autoencoder with the uh, information uh, for pictures of the airplane in the sky or just pictures containing sky. So in all cases, uh, the autoencoder will try to reconstruct the color to be the one which is most popular. So as an example, you see here is we see a ship on the example of the green water. But in most cases, the water is not green, the water is blue. And therefore, autoencoder recolors the image but it makes the water blue. So again, the same principle that once you train the autoencoder on certain data set and use it for reconstruction, it will impart the features of the data set that it was trained on, on the data set you try to reconstruct. So again, this is something to be very careful about. 
Now let's make a small step forward, or at least small step from the point of view of application, a huge step in terms of theory and use into the variation allowed encoder. So we are not going to, since uh, this course is all about the applications and uh, hands-on experience, we are not going to go into the details of how the variation allowed encoders work and how they're different from autoencoders. But uh, one thing that you basically should know is that they're using the reparameterization trick to sample from the Latin space. So the autoencoder has a rigid uh, architecture. You encode the object and then you decode, decode it. The variation allowed encoder tries to uh, be a probabilistic model. So it creates a distribution and samples from the distribution. As the result, it uh, uh, accomplishes uh, new capabilities, which is called the disentanglement of representation. And I'm going to show what that means. So the interesting thing about the variational out encoders is that they were invented in 2014. So this is a technology which is less than 10 years old. So, I mean, look around yourself. So what around you have been invented uh, uh, less than 10 years ago? And it turns out that variation allowed encoder is actually one of those things. So the way we train variation allowed encoder is almost the same as uh, out encoder. So this is the example of the VIE, which is being trained on the MNIST data set. So you can see how the latent uh, distribution evolves. So we start with all the digits jumbled together. And uh, then you can see that they start to be separated. And this is how the latent representation evolves. So you can see that first it is meaningless and then the out encoder learns how to reconstruct the digits. So now what is the disentanglement of representation and why is it so important? So let's make kind of one virtual step ahead. And rather than looking at the simple variational out encoder, look at the conditional variational out encoder. So what the conditional out encoder means, uh, again, keep quiet, sorry. Uh, what the conditional out encoder means is that uh, we now uh, uh, concatenate our uh, data with the class and we decode the data jointly with the class. Practically, it means that we create a Latin space uh, for each digit individually. So we have a Latin space in the, this example, we have one Latin space where we try to embed all the digits. Here we have the Latin space for each digit separately. And uh, so look at these images. So this is Latin space for sixes, this is Latin space for sevens, Latin space for eights and so on. And uh, what do you notice? So you will notice that there is a commonality in this uh, writing styles across the a Latin space. So here, all sixes, all sevens, all eights, all nines, they are short and chubby. So if you move from left to right, you can see that they'll become narrow. Sixes, sevens, eight, nine, they're all narrow now. Uh, if you go from top to bottom, you see that uh, we go from uh, digits being tilted to the left to the smoothly to the digit tilted to the right. So when you look at this, you kind of have a feeling that there is an order. So somehow the variational out encoder found the common traits of variability of the data. And that's exactly what the disentanglement of the representations is. So uh, interestingly enough, it's, uh, this property does not have a rigid, uh, rigorous definition. So at least I was not able to find one until now. But it is something that if you see it, you immediately understand what it is. And this is the great power of our encoder. So first of all, it allows us to find the factors of variation in the data. So you can say, look, we can use the PCA or NMF for that. That's true. But PCA tries to separate the, only the linear factors of variation. And it tries to do it. Uh, and when it does it, it basically creates as many components as necessary to accommodate for all change. Out encoders basically allow us to separate the nonlinear factors of variation. Uh, they are more complex, but uh, there are fewer of them. And what is also very interesting is that 
you can imagine and i can kind of illustrate multiple problems where the autoencoder is very used imagine you want to make a dictionary of hand gestures so the human can uh uh obviously can adopt multiple configurations but generally the shapes that uh, we can illustrate is limited by the structure of our uh, skeleton so we cannot bend our fingers or at least i cannot bend them in the opposite direction so if i take all the pictures of the uh, human hands and the different gestures and try to send them through the out encoder uh, i will be able to essentially get the factors of variation that represent the way the human uh, body can move when we apply the vas uh, for the written digits we essentially <clears throat> derive the factors of variation that are uh, common to the human handwriting meaning the widths and the breadth of the and the tilt so very powerful thing and that's exactly the reason why we try to apply the out encoders for the uh for the analysis of the imaging data because we want to find what is it that is changing inside our materials so uh let's start with the uh few examples of the out encoders and uh, here we are going to uh actually look at the uh so as i said typically you try to uh, illustrate the new uh, algorithms on NIST data set because it's simple but in some sense for the demonstration purposes it's maybe a little bit too much so there are 10 digits we don't need that much so uh, the uh, data set that we made to illustrate the VAEs in a simple way is cards so you basically have four images which correspond to the cards use the clubs bikes uh, arts and so on and then what we decided to do is to add some factors of variability ourselves so remember if you use uh, machine learning to analyze some data it is always a good idea to spend some amount of time analyzing the synthetic data set or data set with the known ground truth because you need to understand what the algorithm does how does it behave and only then you can apply it to the unknown data set so in case of cards uh, we have four uh, uh, four hands so the important thing that this is a factor of variability so the club is different from pike different from the heart secondly we added the continuous factors of variability and the simplest continuous factors of variability that we deal with in imaging is obviously the rotation in plane and we also added shear and we can also add the translation but let's look at the uh, rotation and shear then let's create four synthetic data sets one has a low rotational uh, noise so we just kind of tilt the cards a little bit and low shear another have low rotation and high shear and then as you can imagine uh, third has high rotation and low shear and uh, high rotation and high shear and uh, these uh, uh, images is just the illustrations of how this uh, data set how the objects in this data set look like so there is no particular order here it's just the illustration of the examples and you can see that here they're all kind of almost uh, ideal here they are kind of distorted but not rotated here they're rotated randomly but not distorted and here they're both rotated and distorted so with these examples which are very simple let's take this data set and uh, put it in the normal VA. so this is how it looks like this is the example of the data and this is the latent representation so example of the data is just randomly picked objects latent representation is uh, uh, what happens if we encode them to the latent space and then we decode the, uh, them on the uniform grid so lo and behold uh, what you can see is that uh, the out encoder did exactly what we expected it to do so this is the region which is occupied by uh, diamonds this is the region which is occupied by pikes this is the region occupied by clubs this is the region occupied by hearts you can see that most of these look like they're well reconstructed but there is a small number of them uh, where which is on the boundary between the two different hands and they kind of look distorted that's kind of normal so one important thing is of course when you have the latent representation you of course can reconstruct uh, any number so they here we 
reconstruct the 10 by 10, but of course I can reconstruct 20 by 20 or what's not, it's just a matter of convenience. Now, let's look at uh, how the Latin distributions look like in this case. So again, in order to get the Latin distribution, we take all our original images, we encode them into the Latin space. So now instead of the image, which is, I think for Carl, this was like 40 by 40, uh, instead of image, which is, uh, has the dimensionality 1600, we have the representation as just two Latin uh, variables. And uh, we plot it in this two dimensional space. So notice one very interesting thing that law and, and uh, okay. And then the third thing that we are going to do is that in this case, we have access to the ground truth labels. So we have an access to what was the suit. We have an access to what was the shear value. We have access to what was the angle value. And a super interesting thing happens. So in this case, you can see that our Latin distribution for the suit cards have four uh, well-defined manifolds, right? This is one, this is two, this is three, this is four. You can see that each of these groups corresponds to one suit. So basically, if we take the cards and we don't have the access to the ground truth labels, if we project it to the Latin space of the out encoder, we would be able to separate them very clearly. So, I mean, how you do it practically depends, but for something like this, when you have such kind of long one-dimensional object, the best technique to use on top of the uh, encoder's values would be something like dbscan or tisne or umap. So uh, things like uh, Kimmins clustering will not work and uh, GMM will require a little bit of tweaking to choose the right parameters. But the point is that, that here we know the ground truth labels, but even if we didn't know the ground truth label, we would be able to separate them. Now look at the second very cool thing. So mm -hmm. let's look at the uh, ground truth labels for the angle. So look what happened, that along the manifold corresponding to each suit, the angles change in exactly the same sense. So uh, our angles ch change from minus 12 to 12. Look, for all of them, they go from minus 12 in this part of the image, to 12 in this part of the image. And for this particular suite of cards, actually it is also plus 12 here, but now it kind of goes in this direction. So this is uh, actually the example of how the uh, disentanglement of the representations of the data look like. So we know the uh, ground truth traits, so it's very sheer and angle. And uh, basically what happens is that the out encoder separates that. So for the card data set, it separates it and we can check it. But as you can imagine, it will also do the same type of uh, job for the unknown data set. Okay, super interesting. Let's look at the shear. As you can see, if we use the shear as the ground truth label, uh, nothing interesting goes on. So it looks like everything is mixed. But in one place, you see that uh, the shear, uh, our manifold is actually kind of broadening. It's not exactly 1D. And you can see that the shear label changes perpendicular to the manifold. So locally, the angle and shear are disentangled. Angle changes like this, shear changes like this. So let's see if we can get away with the higher noise level. So now let's take the uh, same data set and uh, add the high shear. So our objects are relatively speaking more distorted. So now if you look at the Latin representation, you can see that, uh, again, we separated our card suits. And you also can see that there is some uh, systematic changes in the way the diamonds, for example, look like. So if you follow this line, you can see how it kind of tries to sort of rotate a little bit. So let's see what happened in the Latin, uh, Latin space. So if you plot the Latin distributions, see what happens. So first of all, now, they are no longer one-dimensional. They form the two-dimensional cloud. Second thing that goes on, they start to mix. And uh, you can see that uh, in this case, if we know the ground truth labels, we can see that this is uh, kind of uh, suit number two, this is suit number three. 
However, imagine that we did not have the colors corresponding to the ground truth label. In this case, it would be very difficult to actually cluster this data, probably possible with the DB scan, but we would definitely have this group and this group represented as two different, uh, two different groups. So this is the limitation of the VAE that once you use it, it tries to disentangle all the factors of variation. Factors of variation include the suit, shear, angle, whatever other factors are down there. Here we know what they are. In the real world, we can only speculate about how many of them. VIE will try to uh, try to disentangle them equally, and it's up to us to interpret what goes on. Anyway, uh, if we look at the uh, ground truth labels for the shear and angle, you can see that actually disentanglement still happens. So you see that in this part of the Latin space, shear is large. Here it is uh, low, but it's not kind of uniform. So the disentanglement is local, but not global. So this is also a limitation of the variation allowed encoders uh, that uh, the disentanglement uh, vector would be uh, locally valid, but globally you need to experiment with that. So what can we do about it? So first of all, uh, since this is a latent and since it is a generative model, we can actually make the experiments when we actually change the way the data look like. So, uh, I mean, you probably all of you have seen the, uh, all these filters and the TikTok or Facebook or whatever that allow you to, uh, take your photo and then predict how you will look like if you are 10 years older, or if you have a mustache or if you take your glasses off or whatever. So interestingly enough that the way these filters work is essentially using the out encoders. They build the relationship, local relationship between the Latin vector and the labels and basically figure out how to interpret the Latin variables in terms of label. So the, once you know what direction corresponds to the addition of the, addition of the uh, glasses or mustache, you basically take the Latin uh, point corresponding to your encoding of your photo, shift it in the direction of the Latin direct, uh, vector corresponding to addition of the mustache, and then you decode that. So obviously that requires high dimensional Latin spaces, but in this cases we can easily change the shears and angles. So the second thing that we can do clearly see is that again, the locally shears and angles are always orthogonal. So here shear changes in this direction, angles ch uh, changes in this direction. Here angle changes in this direction and shear happens in this direction. So very, very convenient. Well, okay, now there is a general principle that if you want to understand something, uh, you, it kind of happens, helps to take it apart or break. Let's see if we can break the VA. And to do that, let's take the data set with a high rotation and low shear. So look what happens in this case. So lo and behold, our manifold, in this case, are still one dimensional, but they look like we imagine that you have a uh, droplet of the syrup and you put it in water and stir. So it doesn't want to dissolve, but it falls this kind of extended line. So it's exactly the same mechanism. So you see that we have a long manifold. You can see that the angle is still changing linearly across the manifold. You see a very clear gradient and uh, for sure, there is kind of no, no space to express the variability, so we cannot disentangle it. And then as the last step, let's just take a high rotation and high shear. So in this case, you can immediately see that uh, our out encoder did not work very well. So once you train the out encoder, and if you see that the latent representation looks like, uh, shows you the object, which are very different from the, the ones that you are trained on, uh, you can immediately conclude that uh, our latent two-dimensional latent space is not enough in this case. So we try to squeeze too many factors of variability in the latent space. And in some sense, you will see it if you look at the latent representations. So in this case, if you look, uh, you can still see big clusters corresponding to the different suits. You can still see that the shear tries to disentangle from the angle, but uh, things are mixed too much. So in this case, the variability of the, in the data is uh, so strong that 
the two-dimensional latent space cannot represent it well. Okay, so this being said, uh, the question becomes, what can you do better? And it turns out that one way we can improve our encoders is to add the invariances to them. So uh, once you develop the out encoders for the imaging data, the kind of the first and most important invariance is the one associated with the rotation. So the reason why we need it is because once we look at the object under the microscope, uh, it can actually have any orientation within the image plane. Sometimes we can say, look, I have the image, I can see the clear crystallographic lattices, let's just choose the crystallographic lattice as the preferred orientation. It can work. It's a fair way to do that and it will work. The only problem uh, in this approach is that if you do that, then uh, it will not work in the cases when you have a grain boundaries or you look at the material with the significant disorders, something like amorphous material. And I'll show you the example of that uh, for the analysis of the electron microscopy of the graphene. So the way we change the out encoders to allow for the invariances, it basically say that, look, some of the latent variables are going to be just general latent variables, the way they are in the vanilla out encoder. But some latent variables are going to be the known physical factors of variation. So we can define one latent variables to allow the rotation. We can design another latent variable to allow the uh, shear in X direction or shear in the Y direction. So basically we kind of uh, add the additional latent variables that have meaning. If we do that, then uh, our dimensionality of the latent space of course increases because uh, we have more, uh, more factors of variation. So strictly speaking, if we want to compare the uh, rotational out encoder with the simple one, we need to choose the three dimensions for the uh, simple and two for the rotation. But for simplicity, let me just illustrate how the rotational invariant out encoders work. So again, this is our example of data. This is the latent representation. So one thing that you will notice in the latent representation if we add the rotational invariance is that now all our features have the same orientation. So if we look at the latent space, then lo and behold, super interesting things happen. So first of all, in this case, our suits, they're not exactly zero dimensional objects, but you can see that instead of be having this extended manifold that span a large part of the latent space, now these are much more localized. And uh, here comes uh, one more very important thing uh, that is different between how the computer science community uses out encoders and how we use them in physics. So uh, in the computer science community, there is a concept of the collapse of the representation. What it means is that you train the out encoder and you, let's say you define the five dimensional Latin space or 20 dimensional Latin space, but your a uh, manifold in the latent space it has much lower dimensionality. So for a two-dimensional space, sometimes you have a, a one-dimensional line or you even have a dot. So notice that the uh, scale on this axis always should be somewhere between minus two to two because this is, uh, uh, it actually comes from the fact that we use the, uh, the way we define the, uh, probabilistic sampling. If it turns out that your latent vector changes from one tenth to minus to minus point uh, one tenth, that means that your representations of the data have collapsed. So the out encoder was not able to discover factors of variability. It basically says that it's all the same. If you are a computer scientist, that would be a problem. If you are a physicist, that actually means that you discover the true factors of variation and uh, what they are, and you know what they are. So from our perspective, VAE tells you not uh, what you know, but it allows you to illustrate how complex are the things that you still don't know. So let's see how this principle works. So in this case, we use the rotational invariant out encoder. 
So you can see that if we allow for rotation to be uh, independent, to be discovered independently, you can see that uh, our representations are kind of much more localized. You can see that now the factor of uh, variation is shear. So compare uh, this data set. So this is the same data set when we did not use rotation invariant out encoder. In this case, our strongest factor of variation is angle. We can barely disentangle the shear. If we now use the rotation invariant out encoder, then uh, shear becomes the predominant factor of variability because angle becomes a separate latent variable. And then what we can do is to compare the angle with the ground truth. We, of course, cannot discover the true value of the angle because uh, our encoder simply doesn't know what is our reference point. It can say that this is the natural orientation and this is the natural orientation. However, we can see that the variation of the reconstructed angle is the same as the variation of the ground truth. So ground truth changes from minus 0.4 to 0.4. You can see that all this curve uh, basically have the same slope and they go from, let's say, minus 0.5 to minus 0.1. So we actually rec can reconstruct the variation of the angles within the data set. Uh, does it work for more complex disorders and shares? Okay, let's add more share. Interestingly enough, again, it works. So you see that in the reconstruction, then they again have the same angle. And uh, now the, our manifolds become extended. So we added the disorder. So they decided that uh, they need to become more extended in the Latin space. And uh, you can see that shear is uh, varying systematically across the, across the manifold. So can we keep doing it? Yes, let's make more rotation. So this is kind of probably the most beautiful example. So in this case, we have a strong rotational disorder. Look what happens. Now our points in the Latin space are almost points, so the, the distributions are very localized. But there is no free lunch. So the out encoder finds the rotation of the statistic in a certain statistical sense, and it's not guaranteed to converge to the true minimum. And this is exactly what you see here. So for this uh, suit, which is number two, you can see that we fall, form two groups. And... Uh, the angle kind of uh, experiences a jump. So this is the angle reconstruction corresponding to this group. This is angle reconstruction corresponding to this group. So can we see this behavior in our previous examples? Absolutely. Look, in this case, you have this group corresponding to label zero and this group corresponding to label one. So these groups cannot cross each other because uh, diamonds are not uh, hard, so they cannot be the same. But at the same time, the way the out encoder works, it tries to squeeze them in the same space. And sometimes the group will be split like this. So the rotational out encoder will have exactly the same problem. So it may split the same group in two. And uh, okay, just to kind of see how far can we go, let's do it for high rotation and high share. So you can see that reconstruction is much better, but we still uh, see this kind of uh, disordered objects. But the latent uh, distributions are absolutely beautiful. So you can see that we form the relatively simpler manifolds. So compare this result, compare it with the, this result when we don't have rotational invariance. So we were able to reconstruct our factors of uh, variability much simpler, much better. Now, before uh, let's do two things now. First, let's see how it works practically. So how difficult it is to use the out encoder. And then we are going to look at several examples where we apply the VIEs for the experimental data set. So while I'm setting up the uh, notebook, uh, let me know if you have any questions so I can uh, uh, answer them or drop the answers into the uh, kind of now or later. Okay, so uh, if there are no questions, let's look at how the, uh, uh, how the out encoders work for the CARS data set and uh, kind of how difficult it is. So, 
uh, kind of as the uh, general statement, uh, if you want to use the normal out encoders without the rotational invariance, whether normal or conditional or whatever, this is a relatively simple approach. And then there are multiple notebook, multiple books that uh, describe them in depth. So either the Ravel Atienza book that uh, I sent as the part of the introduction to the course, or on the Keras IO, or there are multiple implementation and torch and so on and so forth. So rotationally invariant out encoders are relatively speaking more unusual. So first of all, they were developed in the 2019. So uh, it's not even uh, 10 years old. It's more like four years old, uh, four years old technology. And uh, secondly, there are some kind of tricks in how to make it work. So in this case, when I show you the application of VIEs and uh, RVAs, uh, keep in mind that I use the Pyroved developed by Maxim. Uh, it supports all of them in one convenient package. Basically for VIEs, there are other ways of doing it. For the invariant VIEs, probably not. So this is the uh, one implementation that I am aware of. So the, how do we make it work? So we start with the installation. So we install the Pornia. So I'm not going to run it because it's actually maybe I can run it. Let's see how long it will take. And of course it's on the GitHub. So you're welcome to open it and just go through it line by line. So this is our installation. So we install the Pornia and we install the Pyrovet. So Pornia is the library that allows the image augmentation. Pyrovet is the library that contains the out encoders. So once we install that, we uh, import the necessary packages. Ah, actually, one more thing. So let me uh, make the, ah, okay, it's already GPU. So uh, we import the packages. So it's Pyrovet, Cornia, and a few uh, standard libraries like uh, CV, Torch Vision, and so on. So then we define a number of uh, functions that basically allow us to create the data set. So, uh, so look at the, uh, look at the example. So first of all, uh, we create the function that makes our images 64 by 64. Uh, secondly, we read our, uh, data sets and, uh, we, as you normal, we normalize it from zero to one. So this is simple. Uh, so this is uh, get data normalized. So this function actually does the following thing. It starts with taking a card object. It tried to read the list of additional parameters, the quarks, and uh, these parameters, it parses it to get the values of angle, translation, and share. So we can choose to build the data set varying only angle. We can choose the build data set varying angle and translation. We can share all three, it's kind of up to us. So uh, once we get it, we are going to take our car data set. We are going to multiplex it. So we are going to create multiple additional examples. So in this case, it is going to be n samples. And uh, then what we are going to do is to create the list of our transformations. So these are ground truth, angle, translation, and shear. Uh, okay, I've already run this one and share. And uh, then I'm going to apply this as a transform. So I take each card, apply random angle from this list, random translation from this list, random share from this list. So instead of uh, interleave data set, when I have, uh, let's say thousand cards, which are identical, I'm going to apply a random transform by rotating, sharing, or uh, translating each one uh, separately. And then basically what I'm going to report a return is the list of uh, cards. So these are my objects, labels, angles, translations, and share. So this is the plot function. So it's a little bit involved, but basically all it does, it plots the data on a grid. Now let's see what is the data set like. So this is just a, a cards data set. And uh, what we did is we downloaded it and uh, we uh, 
kind of put it in our cloud file system and that's that's what it is it's just a picture so what do we do next next we uh take our actually let me do the following thing so otherwise it will take forever so let me just uh use 300 examples for each car data set rather than 3000 so now we are going to create the data set for uh exactly the same factors of variability so we create one data set when the angle disorder is low and translation is low then we create one with the uh sorry and shear is low then we create where angle is low and shear is high and so on so these are exactly the data sets for which i've shown the examples so let's look at the cards before the translations so this is just our images and uh, now let's uh let's analyze them so for convenience uh, we use the object called the uh, uh, train loader so this is basically the way how we can take the data and give it for uh, out and folder and batches. We can use the out and folder without it, so we can keep all the data in memory and just give it to the out and folder. But in this case, uh, we can run out of memory very fast. So let's pick one data set. So let's choose the one which is number four, and let's choose the all cards or labels uh, corresponding to the number four. So this basically sets up our canvas to run this variational out encoder experiment. And then all we have to do is to train the, <clears throat> train the uh, VAE. So notice that as in any good Python library, uh, everything that after you've done the prep work, all the complex stuff is done uh, under the hood. So the way these libraries are written are to be exceptionally uh, as uh, to be convenient and sort of intuitive so in this case all we need to run the vie on our data is to uh, define the dimension of the data so we can use the same function without any invariances then we just say invariances are none with the rotational translational or both invariances and then the way the uh, out encoder can be run on any data is like this so we define our model so the model has input dimension so this is this value it, uh, you specify the number of latent dimensions if you want you can specify the number of the neurons in the hidden layer so you can tune this um, you can tune the uh, this uh, compression funnel and you define what invariances you want to use so in other words, if you have the data set, you can analyze it with rotational invariance and without rotational invariance just by changing one this parameter. So then the way we train the data is using this trainer and then we train it for so many epochs. So that's it. So while we were talking, uh, the out encoder was uh, training. So you can see that the losses are kind of happily going down. In fact, we are actually done. So for VIEs, uh, it is kind of uh, it's the usual principle. So usually normal VIEs train kind of smoothly. So if you see that the loss is stabilized, that means that it's, things are good. It's not always the case because, for example, if you train the joint out encoders, uh, then sometimes they will stabilize and then they will start to kind of train again. Now let's visualize the results. So before we visualize results, we can visualize the data set. So this is the data set. This is exactly what you have seen as an example in the presentation. Now let's look at the latent uh, representation. So uh, look what happened. So this is the latent representation when I uh, provide the 10 objects. And you can see that in this case, it did not converge completely well. You can see that some of these objects actually look reasonable but some of the part of the latent space look like it's populated by something totally odd. So if I see something like this, that means that in this case, out encoder did not converge properly. And uh, if I want to uh, converge it properly, I have two choices. Either I can train it longer. So rather than 100 epochs, I can train it for 300 and it will converge. Or I can give it more data. I mean, in some sense, giving more data will have the same effect. 
but uh, kind of given the time, let's not do that, but let's just uh, play with the representations. So as I mentioned, we can represent the Latin space as 10 by 10. We can represent it as uh, 100 by 100 by 20 by 20. We can uh, do it 100 by 100. So this is a generative model. So we can generate as many examples as we want, uh, except that if we do 100, then we can should create 10,000 images. It takes quite a while. So let's go back to 10. Uh, and uh, this is how we uh, how we plot the latent distributions. So all we have to do for that is we take our original data and we encode. So once we have the by method, if we apply it to data, it trains the whole VA. But then we also have two methods, encode and decode. So if we have the whole data set and encode, that's equivalent of taking the first uh, half of the out encoder. So once we do that and encode our data uh, and represent it in the Latin space, you can actually see that, interestingly enough, even though our Latin representation is not super good, uh, our Latin distributions are okay. So you can see that there are clusters corresponding to the different ground truth labels for suits and shear. And we can also uh, do the same thing for the angle. So angle and translation. So as you can see, angle is distributed more or less randomly as it should because we took rotation invariant one. And uh, we can run it uh, and see whether we were able to learn the ground truth angle. And the answer is yes, pretty much. So uh, play with this notebook. Uh, so if you have access to the Colab Plus or Pro, sorry, or Pro Plus, then uh, use the GPU. So VAEs are sensitive to that. Uh, if you want to see the images exactly like I've shown, choose the uh, 3000 samples rather than 300 or train longer and uh, experiment with this different data set. So you can uh, basically explore how the adding or reducing disorder affects the behavior of the system in the Latin space. And again, the only way to learn how to use uh, VIEs is uh, to develop the intuition towards the use of the VIEs is uh, to actually apply it for a lot of scenarios and uh, the intuition will build up. So this being said, let's go back to the use cases for, uh, for the use cases of when we use the VIEs for the real world data. So this is actually becoming kind of uh, non-trivial. And uh, let's first of all kind of go back a little bit to the first lectures in the school and uh, think what are the type of data sets we encounter in the electron microscopy. So the first type is obviously eels and stem. Second type is the 4D stem. So these are clear cases of the high dimensional measurements. And uh, of course, we may want to use out encoders to just analyze the images. So when we work in this type of data sets, there are two things that matter. So one thing is the descriptor, another thing is the ML method. So if we analyze the EELS data, our descriptor is very often is just the spectrum at each point. And then when we have the uh, spectrum at each point, we can use the linear dimensionality reduction like PCA and MF and so on. We can use clustering. We can use manifold learning. We can use VAEs. Uh, notice that it doesn't have to be the case. So even for the EELS data set, where the local spectrum is the natural descriptor, I can make a descriptor more complicated. For example, I can choose to use the descriptor, the three-dimensional object that has, uh, uh, let's say, nine adjacent to spectrum. Or I can choose to analyze the EELS spectrum not only in the X space, but in the X and energy space and analyze voxels. So all of this is doable. Uh, in order to do that, you kind of have to have a physical motivation of why this is the right way to analyzing the data. So if you work with the 4D stem, uh, in this case, the natural descriptor is the Ronke gram at each location, but again, it can be more complicated. But again, you need to have a reason to do that. So for images, the uh, situation is a little bit more complicated. So if we want to analyze the images, 
uh, I mean, imagine that you have the thousand by thousand pixel image uh, in the microscope. So if you want to analyze this image uh, by the VAE, first of all, you kind of need to have a large number of those images. And secondly, the question becomes, uh, what is that that you want to learn with that? So it's not exactly the right way to proceed. So the way we analyze the images is we typically generate patches. So same type of approach that we did in the lecture on the use of the linear methods for image analysis. So uh, this approach, when we take the image and break it in the collection of patches centered on the rectangular grid, it is basically strongly connected to how the uh, deep convolutional network look like. So this uh, convolutional filters, they essentially also impose the continual translational symmetry. Uh, this approach is great because it imposes the translational invariance, but uh, this is not always the best way to analyze the atomically resolved data. Because once we analyze the data that has atoms or domain walls or something else, we are, all, um, we are often interested in the specific behaviors of these objects, but not everything else. So one thing uh, we can do, and I will show the example going forward, is we can take the image, find all the atoms in this image, and then we can analyze the uh, atomic coordinates. In fact, I've shown you the example of the uh, local crystallography that uses exactly this approach. So this is great when you are theorists, right? So if you run the molecular dynamic simulation, uh, having local atomic coordinates is pretty much your primary information source. But uh, when we have the microscopy data set, there is a lot of information that cannot be reduced just to atomic coordinates or domain wall coordinates. So one of the ways how we can introduce the district descriptors is to pick atoms in the image and then take an image patch that is centered on the atom rather than centered on the uh, rectangular grid. So in this case, our descriptors are associated with the specific atomic units. There are many other ways how we can uh, define the descriptors. First of all, uh, here it is the normal patch. We can uh, also apply the disk filter. We can choose to pick the descriptor, which includes this atom, and several other regions connected by some form of the translational symmetry. So feature engineering is very important. We just scratched the surface of this feature engineering. However, the way you choose to analyze the data or the way you engineer your features need to be informed by the specific problem that you are thinking about, because otherwise uh, there are too many ways to do it. It's not clear why one is better. And then uh, the way th uh, we make it work is like this. We start with the image. We use uh, some approach to find all the atoms. So it can be maximum finder, the usual blob block, DCNN. So as long as it gives you atomic positions, we are good. And then you create the... So these are the examples of how DCNN works. So you can see that... It actually found all the atoms remarkably well. So this is a perovskite, this is nickel oxide. This worked pretty well. This worked almost perfectly. So the pure perovskite worked ideally. And then we create patches centered on those atoms. Of course, we need to keep track of where the patch have come from. So remember when we analyze the cards, we had the card data set, which is the stack of images. And then we have a ground truth uh, values of the uh, rotation and uh, translation was not. So in this case, we don't have the ground truth values, but we need to keep track. So we create a dictionary which holds the information about the patch and where it came from, from which frame, because we want to analyze movies, and which coordinate within a specific frame. And then we send this uh, collection of images to the, uh, to the VIE. Uh, we extract the latent variables and then we plot the latent variables on the locations of the individual atoms. And generally you get something like this. So this is the original image. Uh, this is the uh, uh, 
uh, rotation uh, extracted from the VAE. These are translations. These are the Latin variables. And uh, one way you can represent it is basically a colorish atom in the color corresponding to the Latin variable. So, lo and behold, instantly you start to see that this analysis actually has given us something. So you can see that the some of these latent images show effectively noise, but some of them show clear variability. And then let's say here and here, we can say that, okay, I understand what goes on. So this is one phase, uh, this is another phase. But if you look a little bit more carefully, you can see that there are other things going on. For example, you can see that this Latin variable becomes higher to the size of the image. And I'll show you where it comes from. Another latent variable shows uh, some smooth variations that seems to be associated with uh, uh, this uh, region over here. So maybe something is going on here. And uh, remember that uh, in the beginning, I said the out encoders, they discover the latent factors of variability in the system. So if we look at the atomically resolved images, our most obvious factors of variability are strains and potentially polarization or, uh, or uh, ferroelastic order parameters. So one of the ways to think about VAEs is that they allow us to discover these factors of variability. They don't tell us that, hey, this is uh, translation, uh, this, sorry, this is strain and this is uh, polarization, but at least we can decouple them and see them, which is already, already awesome. Now, let's uh, kind of look at it a little bit more detail. So choose uh, another image of this uh, Nikilo LSMO system. Uh, this is how we create our patches. So we choose them large enough to encompass the full perovskite unit cell and some neighbors. This is how our latent representation look like. So lo and behold, it actually worked. So if you look at this part of the latent space, you can see that these are four bright atoms and one weak atom in the center. So this is clearly the unit cell centered on the weak atom. On the other hand, you can see the bright central atom and the bright atoms around. So this is the same one centered on Akatan. And if you actually look on the top and look carefully, you will see that some of them kind of look like the atoms of the same type. So it's not obvious immediately, but let's look at it in detail. So this is our uh, latent representations. So image, angle, offsets, latent one, latent two. So we see the same thing. Angles are changing by 90 degrees. Kind of makes sense because uh, as you remember, the angles are chosen, offset chosen randomly. Uh, this shows us the different type of atoms. So we can differentiate the one phase and A and B cations in the other phase. Maybe not surprising. I mean, that's a minimum expectation. But look what happens in the offset images and uh, latents. So this one, is almost noise, except that we clearly see these lines. And the only where these lines can come from is obviously the instability of the microscope operation. At the same time, this latent image doesn't have much atomic contrast. There is a little bit, but kind of not much. It does show the variation, which is very tempting to say that this is strain, something that changes smoothly. So we can do a lot of other things with this uh, latent representations. For example, we can plot the latent distribution, superimpose the kernel density estimate, and you can see that we clearly see three groups of atoms. So, I mean, it's not a surprise, nickel oxide, A side, B side. We can also start to make some conclusion about what are the statistical distribution of atoms in this system. For example, you can see that uh, there are atoms which are intermediate between this group and this group. There are atoms which are intermediate between this group and this group, but there are no atoms which are intermediate between this group and this group. And this kind of corresponds to the translation from the nickel oxide to the, uh, from the nickel oxide to the uh, LSMO phase. We can play more with this data set. So once you have, as I mentioned, once you have the Latin representation, you can uh, apply, uh, Gaussian uh, mixture models or clustering 
separate the how the clusters look like see how they really look like so there is a kind of a lot of ways how you can dig into the data and uh, sort of visualize how it actually looks like so this being said uh from certain perspective we are doing not the best thing and uh what is not good is that we know that there are factors of variation which are continuous uh such as uh, strains or polarization and then there are factors of variation which are discrete which is a side b side or nickel oxide currently we try to squeeze all these factors of variation in the same light and space and if we do that then the strongest factor of variation wins so ideally what we want to do is to, if we want to analyze the subtle differences between the uh, 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 coordinates like what the parameter field or what's not we either need to separate them first in groups and then analyze the VIE uh, within the each group separately or we need to have a different type of VIE which first does clustering and then uh, uh, disentangles the representations so it turns out that we actually have this type of uh, out encoder it's called the joint out encoder we'll talk about it on Tuesday so now let's just dig a little bit more in how we can use the normal uh, and invariant VAEs for the real world problem. So a very good question is out of curiosity, what if we take the ideal crystalline image and apply VAE for that one? So this is a single crystal. This is our latent representation. These are our latent vectors. You can see that all of them are noise, except one latent representation sorry one latent image shows the contrast like this and for those of you that worked with the electron microscope it is immediately obvious what it is this is a distortion due to the flyback delay so it's actually very cool because if you try to analyze how flyback delay affects strains polarization whatever it affects all of them it's just an image distortion but VIE is the database analysis method not physics based so the distortion due to the flyback delay is essentially just one factor of variability that is kind of constant throughout the image and therefore it gets dumped into one latent variable so and as i mentioned uh, we can use VAEs as a generative model so that means that we can also use it in order to compensate for this distortion if we have to now another thing that uh we can mention is the use of the um, VIEs with the shift invariance. So why would we need that? So we need it if we analyze the complex images and we don't want to find the atoms either because it is complicated or because the object is complex and actually doesn't have atoms. It's a mesoscopic imaging. I mean, it doesn't have in a sense, doesn't have features, visible features associated with the atoms. So let's see how it will work. So let's ch 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 uh, take two examples of the uh, images, the uh, bithnot ferrite and the same nickel oxide, the LSMR. And uh, with the LSMR, we have a clear uh, example of the two phases. So we can see them by eye. So it's a convenient uh, problem for checking. For bithnot ferrite, you can see that uh, we see the material, we see the substrate, uh, and we see the some kind of chemical variability inside the system. So uh, we also have here ferroelectric domains, but we cannot detect them by eye. So let's see if the variational out encoder can find it for us. So the first thing that we can try to do, so what we do in this case, we don't find atoms anymore. We use our sliding window approach. And once we took the sliding window approach, we apply it, uh, create the multiple uh, image stacks. We send them into the normal operational out encoder. So as you can um, imagine, if we take the images on the regular grid, that means that our patch is going to have a random uh, alignment with the crystalline lattice. So there would be some shift. 
And it turns out that, in other words, if we have the cation, it can be in the center, it can be a little bit offset, or it can be offset in a different direction. And it turns out that if we uh, try to analyze the data set using the normal VA approach, we get a fairly complex latent representations. So this is the representation for the BF4. This is the latent representation for the LSMO nickel oxide. You can recognize the elements here. I mean, it's well-trained network, it's natural, but the Latin distributions look very complicated. And uh, as I mentioned, it is actually a very interesting thing because uh, generally we are conditioned to think that if we see something complicated, that means it's interesting and contains interesting physics. So it turns out that when we use the PIEs on the experimental data, the situation is exactly opposite. So in those cases, the simpler, the better. So not to the point of the algorithm. Of course, you have to uh, differentiate the result of the analysis being simple and analysis did not working out. So that is kind of difficult. But generally, once you analyze your data and you have a complex distributions like this, this basically means that there are some factors of variability that you didn't take into account properly and then gi they give rise to these complex distributions. So in this particular case, uh, this factor of variability is the offset between our sampling grid and the position of the atomic sites. So it's roughly the same thing as the edge effects in the, in the Fourier transform of the small patches. And uh, if we visualize the uh, latent images, so latent variables on the rectangular grid, uh, you will see that our distributions have this kind of large scale beatings like Moire pattern. This Moire pattern appears exactly because of the mismatch between the atomic uh, grid and the, between the lattice sites and the sampling grid. So interesting, but not useful. So this is what happens if we uh, use the uh, shift VAEs, which allow for rotational and for shift invariances. In this case, we will try to find the descriptions which are the same down to shift. Uh, it's a little bit difficult to train this type of uh, out encoder. So uh, the VIEs usually train in a simple way. Sometimes you need to tweak the uh, beta, which is the Kullback cool uh, cool labor divergence factor. But most of the time, it's not difficult. So shift VA is uh, slightly more complicated, but um, so once you play with them, you actually learn how to do that. And this is the end result. So if I analyze the shift VA for the bismuth uh, ferrite, now you can see that uh, my latent representation is kind of nice and beautiful. My uh, latent images actually show the contrast between the substrate and two ferroelectric domains. You can see here that it failed because there is some distortion due to the mistilt, but I was able to separate the substrate and ferroelectric domains. And you can also see that if we look at the uh, Latin distribution, we now have uh, three peaks. So one peak corresponds to the one ferroelectric domain, another corresponds to another ferroelectric domain, and third corresponds to the substrate. So why is it important? It is important because in this case, we took the image, we did not find atoms, we just used the sampling on the grid, and then we applied the slightly more complex algorithm, the shift VAE, and we start to visualize the order parameters in this image. So this is actually getting to be pretty cool. And it works for other systems, for example, for this LSMO, uh, you can see that this is my latent space, this is my distribution. So you can see a central peak corresponding to one phase, second peak corresponding to the nickel oxide phase. And this is my uh, latent images. One shows the phases and another shows, I don't know what it is, but you can see that there is something unusual about this particle. So it works and the adding invariances really makes a difference. So uh, what are other examples of the VIE use? So <clears throat> crystalline materials are great. So we may, may want to find interfaces, uh, topological defects, uh, imperfection. 
but it's much more interesting to apply the VIEs for the dynamically changing system. For example, graphene or other 2D material. So the workflow is exactly the same. We start with our raw data. We apply the deep convolutional networks network in order to find all the atoms. Uh, we can classify them. So the red are carbon, green are silicon. And uh, we also use the mask to masking to exclude the kind of amorphous phase from the consideration. So, and then we can take the descriptor centered at each atom, send it to the VIE, and uh, as an output, we get the angles and latent variables. See what happens. So in this case, uh, our angle distributions look absolutely beautiful because essentially we have uh, sp3, sorry, sp2 uh, coordinated carbons. So some of them are like this, some of them are like that. There are two sides in the graphene lattice and therefore you see this kind of uh, checkerboard type of pattern. When the graphene undergoes the electron beam induced transformations, you can see that the angles here and here are off. They're uniform within this region. They're uniform within this region. So the one checkerboard, second checkerboard. So the latent variables show something else. So notice that uh, we can clearly establish the relationship between the latent variable and the crystallinity of the graphene. If the graphene is crystalline, latent variable is uh, high. If the crystallinity is low, then the latent variable changes. So basically it tells us that each type of disorder in graphene can be represented as the combination of the latent variables. So this is actually very cool if you think about it, because uh, once you think about the, um, so for those of you that are familiar with the natural language processing, each word becomes the encoding, right? So once, uh, in this case, uh, each defect, no matter the structure, becomes a point in the Latin space. And uh, in fact, this is the illustration of how this looks like. So what you see on the left is the process of the training of the VIE. So in the beginning, it cannot determine anything, and then it learns how to identify atoms. And this is the example of the movie of the graphene undergoing uh, phase transformation under the action of the electron beam, when each atom is colored by the latent variable. And you can see that, you can see the island of the crystalline graphene, you see the almost boiling behavior of the defects that kind of move around, dynamically reconfigure to form the boundaries, and then graphene kind of falls apart in this rafts of the crystalline graphene separated by the uh, extended defects and the whole thing kind of dynamically reconstructing. So the nice thing is that we, of course, can apply this not only to graphene, but to pretty much any system. And then even more interesting things start to happen. So in the VIEs, we can uh, play with the relative importance of two factors. So one factor is the quality of reconstruction. Another is the uh, beta, which is essentially uh, how well the latent uh, distribution should fit the should match the Gaussian distribution, what is called the pullback Leibler factor. So imagine that we take a VIE and we put a much higher premium on the reconstruction. So rather than to find the average behavior, we really wanted to represent our data as well as possible. So this is what happens if you uh, take this type of uh, VIE using the skip connector, uh, which uses the skip connector. Uh, and now look at the latent space. So this is our standard uh, latent uh, representation. You can see that these objects look like exactly like molecules. So this is an ideal graphene. If you look in this part of the latent space, you see something that looks like an edge. So there is three graphene cycles and then there is some, nothing. If you look here in the latent space, you see that there is five member cycle and six member cycle. Here you see the seven member cycle. So it looks like the kind of shots of pictures of organic molecules in the organic chemistry textbook. And from some perspective, this is uh, maybe not a surprise, like, come on, this is just uh, uh, what we expect to see. 
But uh, here goes the second thing, which is sort of uh, unusual when you do the research on the boundary between the machine learning and uh, uh, microscopy or physics in general. You see, uh, for us, it is natural to identify the organic molecule fragments in the output of our encoders and say that that's what we expect to see, nothing special. From point of view of physicists, it's true. But from the point of view of the machine learning algorithm, machine learning algorithm has not read the organic chemistry textbook. It actually took the data that was coming from the microscope and it has found these elements in this data in the unsupervised manner. So let's look at it one more time. We started with the raw observations. So this is just the data streaming from the microscope. We use the deep convolutional network to find all the atoms. So, I mean, we can also use, of course, the uh, peak finder, but no matter what we do, we use the postulate that atom exists, they're discrete and they have known shapes. So in this case, we used a little bit of the prior knowledge in order to sort of discover our atoms. And now lo look what we do when we take the uh, DCN and decoded data and uh, analyze it using the variational out encoder. In this case, this is fully unsupervised analysis. The only postulate we are making is that whatever structures are there, they will be parsimonious in nature. So in some sense, it's almost like an Occam razor. Uh, no matter what the structures are, that there cannot be too many of them. And lo and behold, our variational out encoder has actually discovered those structures. So the correct way to think about it is not as simplified something simple. In this case, what we get is the case of the explainable uh, AI. The machine learning algorithm has given us the results and we were able to interpret it. But it's important to realize that ML algorithm created them by itself without our knowledge. We just interpret it as something reasonable. Uh, which also tells us that if we take this uh, approach and apply it for the data where we don't have the ground truth understanding, we can actually discover something. Now, going in this direction, one has to be careful because sort of uh, you can kind of come up with a uh, somewhat cynical joke that uh, we cannot use machine learning to discover new physics because if it is if we understand what it has discovered it is not new and if it doesn't we don't understand it is uh, not physics that's not exactly true there is a very narrow gap between what we understand what we didn't know before but can understand using ml and this is exactly what we want to explore uh, going too far out, one has to be very careful because if the machine learning algorithm produces something uh, that we don't quite understand, this can happen either because we discover something new and we don't understand it or because the machine learning algorithm didn't work. The second explanation is much more likely and uh, as a good scientist, that's what we adopt most of the time. Nonetheless, ML algorithm can give us very valuable leads into what happens inside the system. So. Kind of returning back to our out encoders in Latin space, what else can we do? Turns out that uh, once we have the Latin vectors, we can actually try to figure out what is their physical meaning. And one of the ways we can do that is we can take our Latin space, which is two-dimensional, we can decode the objects from the Latin space, and then we can simply calculate, for example, the number of the um, number of the atoms in the decoding object. So it is always centered on central atom by design. And you can see that, let's count the number of the six member rings. So you can see that most of the Latin space is occupied by three six member rings. There are areas which have two member, two six member rings. There are areas that have uh, uh, zero. So uh, we can count the number of the five member rings, uh, seven member rings and so on and so forth. And uh, then we can kind of superimpose it. And it turns out that the regions with the different molecular structures, in this case, number of rings, they kind of form a very well-defined uh, clusters in the Latin space. 
uh, this behavior is universal. So if you apply the VAEs for the physically defined system, and then you try to decode the Latin space in terms of the physical meaning, typically it kind of changes pretty smoothly along the Latin, Latin variables. So let's look at a few more examples. So the natural uh, application for the VAEs is for the stem. So that's kind of goes without saying. It turns out that if you take a 4D stem and apply the normal VAE, you will get something like this. Uh, it didn't work very well. So you need to apply the rotation invariant VAEs. But uh, if you do that, then you get something, at least for with poor reconstruction, then your Latin representations start to look uh, almost like uh, center of max X, Y, and R. So there is... Uh, these are essentially the primary factors of variability. So it may be very interesting to apply the more high dimensional VAEs for the analysis for the, of the 4D stem data, but uh, you will not be able to do that on the, on the collab. So that is something that actually needs to be done on the supercomputer because if your input data set is 32 by 32, you can do it on the collab. If it is uh, uh, 256 by 256, you run down on memory. However, even for the low dimensional objects, you can analyze 4D stem on the, some materials, identify the defects, so it's kind of very visible, and uh, so on and so forth. So uh, as 4D stem become more powerful, you can apply it for more complex objects. For example, this is an example of the uh, VA analysis of the 4D stem on the grain boundary in the bitmap ferrite. So you can clearly see that the colors of the Latin variables on this side and this side are totally different. And uh, as I mentioned, we also can have techniques like joint VAs, which also allow us to disentangle representations and classify our structures. And then uh, this disambiguation becomes even more visible. So all of this is the part of the pyruvet. Uh, so you will find both the examples and the uh, docs there. Now, before we go to the, have a quick look at the, how the uh, VIEs can be looked, applied for the real world problem. Let's talk briefly about the applications of the VIEs for the cases when we don't have atoms. So for the analysis of the mesoscopic data sets. So this is the example of a uh, such data set when we uh, observe the dynamic of ferroelectric and ferroelastic domain walls. So, for simple, if you are familiar with the ferroelectrics, you will recognize what it is. If not, then think about it as just a phase transformation front. So that's it. But this is a phase transformation front that is associated with the two types of domain walls. So one type is called 180 degree domain walls. They're very easy to identify. They correspond to polarization going up and down. The second is ferroelastic domain wall when the polarization changes at the angle. and uh, uh, ferroelectric ones are very easy to find by just kind of filter. Uh, ferroelastic one are a little bit more complicated. This is where we need to use the fairly complicated uh, rest head net type of architectures to find them, but it's doable. And then what we can do is we can analyze the physics of switching phenomena, but in this case, we choose our descriptors to stay exactly on the domain wall. So in other words, we don't sample our object to get patches everywhere on the grid. We choose the domain wall. We take a random point from the domain wall and take a patch centered on the domain wall. So look what happens if we uh, analyze the data like this. So you can see that uh, our Latin space in the uh, Latin representation in this case has a kind of representation of uh, what are the possible geometries and factors of variability in the domain structure. So here we have the standard flat domain walls. Here they become curved. Here we have the region when the domain wall are kind of uh, like a needle points. So they correspond to this part of the object. And uh, here we have more complex domain structures. So what we can do in this case, we can actually try to extract some physical meanings out of that. So for example, we can extract the domain wall count. So uh, oh, one, uh, two, three, and so on. Uh, zero, one, uh, two, and more. So depending. 
we can extract the switching degree, we can extract the average wall curvature and so on. And basically the physical properties of interest now are associated with some form of the distribution in the latent space of the system. We can also extend this approach to analyze the time dynamic. So for example, we can uh, uh, pick the position, the domain wall at one time, but take a patch at the image, which is uh, a few time steps ahead. And if you do that, then our features are engineered to include the information of the domain wall uh, dynamics in the system. So we can use exactly the same approach of uh, using the VIE and analyzing the latent space. So in this case, our structures are very different because uh, they represent the change rather than static configurations. And again, we can analyze the wall count, uh, uh, convexity of the curvature of the domain wall significance and so on. So in this case, uh, based on experience working with the system, I can conclude that our statistics is actually not enough to get a good representation. So we see something, but typically when you have the sharp boundaries and kind of multiple objects, that seems like we would prefer to have much more information in this case. But again, the principle works. And uh, we can even build the local picture of the domain wall dynamic when we, let's say, have the domain wall and see how it moves. And uh, then we see how the latent variable evolves across the domain wall motion. So we can start building the dynamic phenomena, for example, correlating the velocity of the domain wall motion and the values of the latent vectors. And this way we we'll learn what is the coupling between the latent variable and the, and the wall velocity. So the final thing that I want to show before we go to the collab for the real material is uh, how do we interpret uh, the meaning of the latent variables? And the answer is that it is actually difficult. It is very domain specific. And sometimes it actually kind of takes quite a while to figure out what they mean and how to interpret them. So uh, generally it requires the specific domain expertise. So one case when uh, it actually worked remarkably well is exactly the same sample. But now imagine that rather than having that autoencoder that works on the essentially one image channel, we have the autoencoder that works on uh, two or more image channels. So we kind of have a, like a RGB image. And one component of this image is the intensity of the ferroelectric wall. And another is the intensity of the ferroelastic wall. So red color is the ferroelectricity, uh, blue color is ferroelasticity. So in this case, the latent space looks like this. And the first time we got it about three years ago, it looked like uh, really something which is absolutely not clear what it is. However, if you uh, start to think logically about what it may mean, it becomes uh, pretty clear uh, relatively fast. So for example, in this part of the Latin space, we have the red walls, which have more or less constant intensity and blue walls having constant intensity side by side. What does it tell us? It tells us that the ferroelectric and ferroelastic walls coincide and basically what it means that this is the case where the ferroelectric wall is pinned at the ferroelastic wall. So what happens in this part? So here you can see that the red wall is bright in the center. It's not surprising because that's how we choose our descriptors, but then it sort of loses intensity to the ends and there is no blue color. What does it tell you? It actually tells you two things. So first of all, this is not a pin domain wall because there is no ferroelastic component. And secondly, the fact that it's more intense in the center and drops intensity to the edges means that the edges kind of move around and the out encoder represented by smearing of the color. So this is gold, which is not pinned and dynamic. Jointly, that tells you that uh, you can, I mean, to be rigorous, you need to look at the latent uh, distribution, but, in, it would give you, tell you the same story, but jointly it tells you if the wall is pinned, it doesn't move and the wall is not pinned, then it can be dynamically rearranging itself. So what happens here? It is actually kind of interesting because now you see that the red wall is uh, pretty much uh, constant intensity. So it's pinned, but 
you don't have a blue wall, you have a kind of blue color overall. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that you don't have a single ferroelastic wall. You kind of have multiple ferroelastic walls, which uh, kind of average out to give the uh, uniform uh, spectrum. So what this means is that the ferroelectric wall is actually pinned by the edges of the ferroelastic domains. So once we identify what happens in the different part of the latent space, then we of course can proceed to assign the specific meaning for the dynamic processes and so on and so forth. So we can identify pinning efficiency, uh, coincidence, gradients, and so on. So whatever we feel will give us physics. So this being said, uh, as the last thing for today, uh, let's uh, have a look at how these uh, algorithms work for uh, real world data. So let me uh, share the screen with you. So this is the example of the notebook, uh, which uh, uh, I actually I didn't share it to the GitHub. So unfortunately, courtesy of Delta, I ended up being home this morning, 20 minutes before lecture rather than, uh, rather than yesterday evening. So let me share it with you here. Uh, here we go. Okay, so now you have access to it. So it's appeared on the collab on the GitHub. So I'm not going to run it because it actually uh, takes some time, but let me just illustrate what we are doing here. So first of all, we download the data sets. So of course, when the data set is downloaded, it is uh, sitting in the, uh, in the, uh, it's sitting in the, uh, our file space. We install exactly the same uh, Cornea and Atom AI. We install exactly the same libraries. In fact, if you compare the notebook for cards and this notebook there, pretty much the same. So we download, we load the images. So the raw images, the DCNN output and the atomic coordinates that we have from DCNN. So uh, kind of this is where we start. And uh, uh, in uh, lecture four or five lectures ago, when uh, Manya talked about the DCNN analysis, you see, Ayana, sorry, talked about DCNN analysis, you see how it was done. Uh, we can explore the data. So this is our experimental data. This is the DCNN output. This is the atomic coordinates. So these are the three data set that we are looking at. Uh, this is how we make the feature vectors. So we start, we define our window size. We use the option of the, uh, find the images, uh, and, uh, uh, we basically create the stack of images that uh, we can analyze. So notice that, again, everything that we are doing is uh, organized like a workflow. So we don't, we can analyze things very efficiently. So we have one function that uh, creates the single array and we create the uh, stack of images. So that's basically it. We use the stack of images to initiate our train loader. So same way as we did it for the cards. Uh, we create our uh, arrays that contain the information about frames and the um, center of masses, uh, sorry, coordinates. So this is uh, something that you will spend most of the time figuring out once you start to apply it your own data, because these are very convenient objects, but you need to look in them and figure out what they are. So for example, if we look at the COMOL, let's see what it is. So as you can see that this is just an array that contains all the, uh, all the coordinates. So let's see uh, what is the information here. So it's array which contains numbers, it's a coordinates and image plane. So frames all is the cord array that contains the information of the frames for each uh, point in the image stack. So you can see that it's a linear array which goes from zero to 49 because we have exactly 50 
images in the video stack uh, in the video and then im, im stack is actually is where our data is so if i look at its shape you can see that im stack is uh, this is uh, uh, 73000 images or 73000 patches uh, they have a color depth of one so we uh, uh, basically treat them as monochromatic each image is 40 by 40. so uh, we can use the same function to visualize the elements of the im stack so these are just patches centered on atoms and uh, then you already have seen this analysis so you actually you can run this notebook and basically reproduce the results of the our science advances paper two years ago and you can experiment with the invariances, rotational, translational, so on. So in this case, um, we have chosen to have a larger number of the, of the uh, neurons and include, have the RNT invariance. We train it exactly the same way as we trained before. Uh, to be honest, if you don't want to train, we can actually give you access to the already trained notebook then you can visualize the latent space and uh, then you can visualize the latent distribution so if you visualize the angles there are two peaks two possible orientations of the carbons these are our offsets and uh, this is how we get the images that i've shown so these are the visualization of encoded angle uh first and second latent variable so uh, this is it so feel free to play with it and uh, this should be fairly straightforward to apply it for any uh, of your own data set. So obviously uh, here we start with the already known coordinates. So if you want to apply it for your own data set, you need to start with the notebooks that show the DCNN analysis. But uh, let's stop it at here, here and uh, let me know if you have any questions. So put them in the chat. So in the meanwhile, uh, let me also mention what we are going to talk about in the next two lectures. So we are going to talk about the special classes of our encoders, the semi-supervised joint and the uh, conditional. So these are much more complex methods in terms of what they mean. Uh, so we understand them less well than the normal out encoders, but at least to some extent and i'll show how they can be used both for uh, structural and spectral data so after that we are going to talk about uh, encoders decoders meaning how we can learn structure property relationship and after that we are going back to the active learning experiments where we use the deep kernel learning and uh, show how it works what it is and how to use it for the human in the loop uh, interaction interventions in the automated experiment so, are there any questions? Okay, uh, if not, then uh, let's call it a day and uh, uh, see you at least in the list of participants uh, next Tuesday. Bye.